welcome to this our very first uh, book lunch. Not launch, but lunch. I'm your host, Mitch Hampton. And I think this is going to be an interesting, uh, interesting and exciting way to inaugurate this, uh, this series. Um, I'm going to talk about... Adam Gopnik's Warhol. Now, there's so many things to cover uh, with Warhol, and I want to cover them in a, in a kind of um, my aesthetic way, by which I mean um, that I'm interested in the feelings that people get when an artist creates something. So I'm going to start with something rather personal get less personal, talk about, you know, this book, which is a wonderful biography. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about um, my first sort of, you might say intimate close connection with particular Warhol work and how that came about and what that meant. And then I'm going to talk about the biography as a form because this book, um, look at this, um, which I've read, it's almost a thousand pages. And that's actually, I should say that's very fairly standard in this kind of genre biography. I mean, look at this book. Uh, it's another co comp contrast here. Comparison. Bob Fosse book by Sam Lawson's, also big and thick. Uh, you know, I could go, I, I read now, I read these books uh, for a number of reasons. Now, um, I want to say about this particular book is that it's, um, Yes, it's comprehensive. I mean, an enormous amount of research goes into something like this. And I'd like to think that as we go into the future, that this kind of bio continues to be written and made and that uh, people of, of uh, scholarship like Blake Gopnik here, the art historian, but he, but he really uh, delves into Warhol's life will make these what I call doorstop books, these big dictionaries, dictionary weight sized uh, books. Um, there's a place for it, very important place for it. And the uh, reason for that, I think, is that when you appraise a person's life, particularly someone is, is, um, is as containing multitudes as Warhol, I mean, Warhol, um, arguably not only revolutionized art and culture, but um, encompass many different um, things going on to the middle to late 20th century to now and seem to synthesize them in a quite interesting way. Now, I encountered Warhol in an intimate way through his films. And I mean in particular the pre-Paul Morrissey films or what, well, actually Morrissey worked on some of those as well, but I mean the ones that are non-narrative, quote unquote non-narrative from the 60s and I came into contact with those because I used to go to Massachusetts Art School of Art Film Society. We call it Mass Art Film Society. And the uh, major person there, leader, uh, uh, was Saul Levine, who himself was very influenced by um, Ken, uh, Stan Brackage and wasn't was and is an experimental filmmaker. And on Wednesday nights, he would have these uh, screenings in this basement of mass art, uh, downtown Boston. These, these it's kind of go into a basement. It's like a maze. You got to go through all these doors, and and you go by paint artist studios and people working on sculpture. And you would go into this like what is a basement? And there's these rows of chairs. And in that, I went to those screenings probably for a good 10, 11, 12, 13 years. I think they were on Wednesday nights. And I met some of our guests through that very, uh, that's, that had been on our podcast through that very, uh, me, like Miley Kober. I, I uh, got to know her and, and see her films because she was a guest there, I think, when she was still in the States. Anyhow, uh, what Saul would do is he would screen the original prints of these 60s movies. And by these movies, I mean movies like 
Couch, Kiss, um, Blowjob, which I'll get to in a second. And um, there's, there's so many. Um, and he would screen them in the proper way, the original print, the black and white, and you know, the way, and so we were basically screening these films the way you would have seen them had you been around in the mid sixties and seen them at the factory or in a screen in New York city. So you actually transported like time, real time travel to the feeling of watching Nico and watching Bridget and uh, Ondine and uh, his characters, these people that he populated his films uh, on this, on this projected screen. And one of the first things that struck me watching these films screen properly is how um, how serious and artistic and poetic a filmmaker he was. These are shorts. And I sort of feel, and also the time they were done, because he was doing these in the mid 60s and the sense of duration and time passing as he's filmed these subjects. Like for example, this movie Blowjob, is a black and white film of a man's face, I think, receiving this, this sexual um, act. And you see his face go through these, these changes, these contortions. And, you know, you know, when you watch that film, which you should, um, I feel like that he, what Warhol is doing in, in that film in particular is something very similar to what Bresson was doing, what Dreyer was doing, in terms, not just only in terms of the seriousness, but in terms of the feeling you get watching it so that, you know, it's not really about this particular act. It's about some kind of um, sort of state of consciousness, which he's capturing in real time. And I guess the penultimate of these types of films was the Chelsea Girls, which I saw screen pr uh, properly because there's all these, um, when it comes to Warhol's films of that period, uh, particularly Chelsea Girls, there's all these rules about how it's supposed to be projected with the, with the, the two different projectors. And, and, and Solovine's very uh, conscientious about all that. He would project it properly. So you've actually seen Chelsea Girls um, properly. Now, when I was uh, watching these movies, I was starting, I was realizing because I had, I had seen Tarkovsky and seen, you know, uh, some of these art films, but I feel like Warhol was doing similar things not only at the same time, but in some instances even earlier. And so, which brings me to this book. Now, in the beginning of this book, um, Blake Gottnick, and all good biographies do this, they are able to, in prose, take you into a human being's life and also the context of that life and what was going on culturally, what's going on. And so Warhol had a whole career, a whole life before his high, fine art life, even though he did go to art school in Pittsburgh, as a commercial uh, artist, doing store windows at Bonwick Teller, doing shoe, you know, doing sh um, shoe displays. Uh, and, you know, I have an example here in this book. And also commercial illustrations of great jazz album covers, like some of my favorite musicians, like Kenny Burrell album cover. And uh, it's really, uh, it's really quite something. So if we pretend that Warhol's not Warhol, if he's just John, I don't know, John Wyndham. Imagine it's John Wyndham and you know, you come across these archives in the fifties and New Yorker, you did New Yorker covers. You would look at those and say, these are really good, well done, popular designs or popular um, illustrations with the hand. And you would look at it and you would, you wouldn't, have, uh, you would look at that and you would, you would see it as uh, both representative of what a lot of folks were doing at the time, but also was totally unique, but you would categorize it conceptually in your mind as a certain kind of thing. That's, you know, for, that's for a record album. That's to promote something. That's to sell shoes at Bergdorf Goodman or Bonwit Teller, or that's for Vogue magazine. Now, at Journey in the Street, I consider all that stuff really important. I don't really uh, think, I certainly don't think that any of that kind of work is, um, is disbarred from serious discussion, certainly in terms of value, but it is a style. So Warhol is doing, is getting, coming to New York and being successful doing that kind of work. 
in the 50s, like late 40s, early 50s. And so in a way, Warhol has this whole life as that kind of artist. In a way, before the factory and before the, the 70s and before the, you know. And so he, he has all these different, so, but then, you know, I'm thinking uh, one of the virtues of uh, Blake Gottman's book, and I'm very thankful to him for doing this, is that he has a way of, uh, through periodization, he breaks up um, the timeline and date. So it starts off in to the 40s and his childhood, and, which is fairly standard. But because of his prose and because of his, um, the way he writes, I actually get the feeling that I kind of am feeling what people in that time were feeling, what Warhol might have been feeling. And uh, all the things going on in the time with abstract expressionism and there's tensions because, uh, you know, Warhol loved Jasper Johns, but there was, there was um, you know, Warhol was always the outsider. In other words, in a very, we should say, um, I guess, heterosexual male dominated world, which that was, some, some say macho world. Uh, Warhol had a very different sensibility um, as a gay man and a gay man in the 50s in New York and that, and that uh, Warhol did cultivate that sense of, um, uh, you might say, uh, alienation from the dominant culture and made that an important part of his art. Um, and he was doing that, but I, but I think so. I, one of the things I like about this book is that through the prose, because that's how this is accomplished is prose. This is a form of, this is a form of writing after all, um, is that you're actually getting inside the world. And I don't, I don't really think there's any other way to do that uh, than through, through this means. Now, at, at the same time that, I, uh, that this came out, now there's a Netflix documentary which is based on the Andrew Warhol Diaries edited by Pat Hackett from the 80s, early 80s, which I do not have a copy of because my father had it. And then when my father died, it sort of got lost and I haven't, I haven't uh, repurchased an, a new, new edition. So I just have this. I have, um, this is the first edition of um, Bob Colicello's book on Warhol, Holy Terror. And hold on here. And this is a first edition of the philosophy of Andy Warhol. Um, which is, I, I, Warhol is very, a lot of humor and wit in this book, and a lot of apersues, cryptic apersues, and jokes. And it's really, it's really quite something. Um, so as you go through this book, and again, you need a book of this length to do this. You go through the 50s, you go through the 60s, go through the 70s. Um, the Factory, Lou Reed, The Velvet Underground, Paul Morrissey, him getting shot by Valerie Salinas, the aftermath of that shooting, which never never fully healed and I think I think haunted and, and also defined Warhol's aesthetic and sensibility to, to hit to his very end of his life, I think, in important ways. And the people, the people uh, around him and then Studio 54 in the 70s. But as you travel through these uh, things as, as, as expressed in this book, you sort of feel like you, you're traveling there. You sort of feel like, well, I can feel what it's like to be in that milieu with those people. I don't think there's a greater accomplishment that a writer can achieve than that, is to sort of really take you there, take you into the time, create sort of a feeling of empathy or a feeling of fellow feeling of what is going on. But it's not, again, this is not, um, there's different kinds of biographies. And this this book does a really good job of, of showing that Warhol was, was a complete genius and did all these many things. I mean, at the end of his life, he's, he's interested in um, graffiti art and he's uh, collaborating with Basquiat and, 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 and a really incredible show in the 80s and he's part of 80s culture. He has a show on MTV, so he's going, he's always doing things. 
and everything he's doing is interesting. Um, at, when you come to the end of Warhol's life, he's uh, dealing with his Byzantine Catholic faith, which was important to him in the Last Supper paintings, and using political, uh, politically coded messages in some of the art and text about reference to the AIDS uh, epidemic at that time. Now, the Netflix series is much more um, explicit about his romantic life, his sexual life. His, his partners like um, John Gould and Ted Johnston. Now, these are Ted Johnston made, made a film called Bad, which I really liked for a while. But, you know, Netflix series decides to go a more personal kind of route. And focusing on the fact that Warhol was a, was a man, Warhol was a person that had lovers, uh, Warhol was a person, um, I think, in an attempt to kind of make him a little bit relatable for an audience. And there's an enormous amount of footage, home video footage in, in the documentary on Netflix. Um, putting the, this book aside for a second, I want to talk about one aspect of the Netflix series, which I really loved in which actually connects quite directly to our podcast. And that's Jessica Beck, the curator at the Warhol Museum. There's a lot of footage of Jessica Beck looking at a Warhol painting, like looking at the Campbell soup or looking at the Last Supper, the Christian paintings at the end with the camouflage, which are really, really something. Um, and talking about it, and I sort of, I was, because I, I never really uh, acquainted myself with Jessica Beck. I'd love to have her on the show. But the way she talks about the Warhol work is with um, a kind of um, utmost respect and a, and a kind of um, really, again, like this bio does, sort of going inside the work and not being beclouded by too many preconceptions about what you think you've heard about Warhol and people have said about him. And I just love that. I just, I mean, I thought Jessica Beck, that they let her talk at that length about the work. She says, well, this is what this painting is doing. And you feel it and I feel it. And that's the feeling I get, I got watching those films in Saul Levine's basement at Mass Art. And that's actually, I think before I actually saw some of the sort of physical um, paintings. Now, I have a, I want to say a few things about the, um, oh, how do I put it? The misunderstanding of Warhol, if that's a word for it, and what I think it comes from. So I think Warhol, the reason why he's an artist for our time is that our time is pluralistic. Our time is about um, dissolving boundaries between things. So dissolving boundaries, obviously, between high art and popular art, of course. I should add, though, that Warhol is very much a high artist. He's very much someone that's uh, really interested in, in very, um, shall we say, highbrow esoteric. I mean, he was into John Cage. And, and, and so I don't want to get the impression that that Warhol was, Warhol's not there, was all things. And I think that's kind of uh, one of the important things about him is the way he combined these things. But I feel there's always been a resistance to this. And I think the resistance to Warhol, I think is rooted, I, I suspect in a kind of mid 20th century, mid late 20th century, I think purism or want, or gatekeeping and a sense that, you know, art, modern art must be like Kandinsky, right? If it's not like Kandinsky, if it's if you if you're painting Elizabeth Taylor, right, <laughs> or Elvis Presley with a gun, you know, which are Warhol figures, or if you're putting camouflage on The Last Supper, that you're kind of doing something incorrect. Now I know, of course, this this attitude of thankfully I think is dying out. I don't think it's as predominant as it used to be, thankfully. But I but I think a lot of that um, again, people haven't encountered Warhol the work or Warhol, the man in this book, they're um, coming with their preconceptions about it. And I really appreciate Blake Gottmik for, you know, giving Warhol his due. And I don't, I think it could only happen in, in a book this big. It's a thousand pages. I really do think that. And I would love, I uh, hope that I can have him on the show and ask him about his life. He comes from a quite extraordinary family, as you may know. 
and Allison got Nick and Adam got Nick. And uh, he could talk about that. And, and I think, uh, but I, I, you know, the reflections on this and the, and, and, and the feeling of um, uh, him going through all these eras are that he was really constructed by the 40s and 50s, Warhol. Working class Pittsburgh, he lifelong Democrat, li liberal side. He was true to that, actually. Um, I sort of feel like there's a there is a through line um, from his from his roots in Pittsburgh, and I sort of feel like you know that um, you know Warhol, in a sense, is speaking to our current moment because in our current moment now, of course, we're still obsessed with celebrity and famous people. Warhol's idea is someone's famous. He did society portrait portraiture. Like people would commission him, like famous people, people that had a lot of money would commission him to do their portrait. But you know what? Artists have done that in every century around the world. In other words, it would only be in the modern period, right? By what modern, I don't mean contemporary. I mean like sort of the 50s, 60s, 70s. It would be in those years that you would, you know, be sickened by that or find that offensive. Because, uh, uh, you know, definitions of art change. And like, well, well, we don't do that. You know, art. if you're an artist, you're a painter, you have to show in a gallery, you have to show in O.K. Harris and Leo Castelli, you know, but you don't take commissions to paint, you know, heads of state or rock stars, you know. But, you know, traditionally in the classical period, that's what painters did. That's what John Senior Sargent did. John Senior Sargent painted notable people in society and was commissioned to do that. And so that's part of art. You can like it, you can dislike it, but, it, you know, I think the the pluralism in Warhol, the the fact that he embraced he embraced uh, early uh, popular art in the eighties, Fab Fab Five Freddy, and you know Basket Basquiat, and he uh, he's somebody that's saying let's let it all into the work, let's not leave it out of the work, let's bring the world in. So I think if there's a um, a theme in War, Warhol's um, ethos, it's you don't leave the world at the door, you bring the, the, the world into your house, you bring it into the art gallery, you bring it into bring it into the art space, and you talk about it. You could criticize it, the world, you can have problems with it, you could rail against it, you could um, be turned on by it. You know, as, as a gay man, there's a neurotic dimension to his work, there's even Paintings about Cox and there's there's um there's all kind. I mean, he just did so much, and um, you could have all sorts of attitudes about it about the world, but I think the 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 theme is that the world is there. I also want to say some, a couple of things. I do believe that Warhol was autistic, which isn't discussed at all in this book, and I think it is somewhat an open question. Um. The role, the role that his autism played in his work, I feel it does play a role. I don't think it's the penultimate, most decisive factor, but I do think it plays a role. Uh, I, I, don't, I do think you can understand Warhol's work and appreciate it without knowing about that. I do, but I think I think there's some more uh, work to be done in that in that uh, factor, so psychology Warhol. And I, I really like you know. On our show, I really like this idea. Oh, Laurie's asking a question. I wonder what Warhol would have felt about our current Zoom online world. Warhol would have been all over it. Warhol would have had Zoom pictures in, in gallery spaces. He would have done performances on Zoom. He would, he would have loved NFT, from what I understand, and cryptocurrency. I don't. I personally have problems with that because of my own leftism, but I'll put that aside for the moment. But he would have, he would have, he would have, uh, you know, he would have been, yeah, because Warhol is about embracing what's happening. Warhol is about if someone's famous, you want to get to know this person that's famous because they're famous. Um, but from my perspective, you know, you could hate someone who's famous. Like you could, you, 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 yeah, right. You could hate someone that's famous. But I think for, I think the question is there's before Warhol and after Warhol. And I think after Warhol, in the in the world of the humanities, you have to bring the world in. And I think before Warhol, people um, were kind of like this a little bit. 
they they had I think their attitude was I want to be in a garret or a village and not and and ignore totally the world. And I think what Warhol says, and I don't think it's just Warhol. Again, you know, Rauschenberg is a lot going on with dealing with the world. I think it's bringing the world in. And I think it's actually a secondary consideration, your attitude towards that world, right? So I think if you can bring the world in and you, like if I, if I, um, like let's say, let's say I'm an artist and I'm, I, I, let's say I have a, uh, I don't know, a love for a certain celebrity. It's like, I love this celebrity. Like I have a, um, a signed photo of Jacqueline Bisson back there, you know, because I met her and she signed, she signed her rich and famous poster. I'm not saying this is exactly me, but let's say, you know, uh, I made an artwork about my love, love of ja Jacqueline Bissett, Bissett, right? And I had uh, Jacqueline Bissett when she was 19 in the 60s or something and in the 70s. And I, I sort of, it could be kind of a, maybe a little bit um, superficial or not very deep sort of um, fan art, you know, like fan fiction. I'm just a fan, um, let's say, right? That's a certain attitude. The attitude happens to be positive, uh, maybe uncritical, maybe just like worshipful, I don't know. Now I don't have that attitude. Of, well, I do like Jacqueline Bissett, but I don't go that far with it. But, uh, but um, that's just an attitude. Now you can have the opposite attitude and a lot of um, contemporary political art is angry. It's angry about injustice. And that's bringing the world in. That's not denying the world, but that's saying, look, the world must change. This thing in the world we don't like. I see that actually. I'm just watching, goodness, The Dropout, Amanda Siegfried, this extraordinary series about the Theranos scandal is really interesting. And um, Stephen Fry's in it. And, and it's just, I mean, that series is really about, you know, it's a TV series that's very critical in some ways of startup culture and kind of the, um, the unethical aspects of startup culture. Now that's a that's a critical attitude, but the thing of it is, you're still talking about something that's in the headlines, right? You're still talking about the world, and that's what I take most from Warhol. Is like he's saying, "Let's bring the world in," and I appreciate that. And I also like the way he brought the world in, and I do think he's a forerunner in all, especially avant-garde, avant-garde cinema. Certainly, just those film short films are incredible. I can't recommend enough. If you're stuck at home and have to see it on Vimeo, fine, but watch the Chelsea, Chelsea Girls and, and um, Couch and Kiss These Films. And, you know, he's a forerunner of, um, well, there's just so much. I mean, so that's why this book is as big as it is. That's why I'm happy to have read it. I have one more thing to say before I go. I'm going to do more book lunches on different kinds of books. Now, you might wonder... If I read these books, yes, I've read them. Now, you might be thinking, you know, how do I do it? Time. Well, when I was about um, 13, 14, 12, between 12 and 14, my dad um, developed a program. He thought that you could teach speed reading. And he made a kind of a homeschool type class, I think in the 70s. and I think me and my my best friend, and he would try to use ways of getting us to speed read um, newspaper articles and then some Shakespeare. I think we read a Shakespeare play. Um, and so I think I was influenced by that very intensive kind of, um, it's a skill, right? Like practicing the piano, uh, reading's a skill. And so um, I, I would call myself a partial speed reader. And of course, if you're reading certain kinds of texts, like if you're reading works of complex fiction, like uh, say I just finished um, Wintering, which is a wonderful book by, uh, I forget her name, Catherine. Anyhow, it's a book of meditations. Or if you're reading Henry James, right? Those sentences have a lot of subordinate clauses. They're complex sentences. They're emotionally complex. You do read that a little bit slower. So in general, I mean, I find I do read nonfiction a little quicker. Um, 
but even though I do read, read uh, fiction slower, I think I read, I learned how to read even fiction at a good pace where you can get through more information. Now, so I learned how to do that. And then the result is this podcast. So here, here's the thing. When I'm reading a, a book like Blake got this book on Warhol, not only am I sort of immersing myself in the world of the 50s, the 60s, Studio 54, I feel like I'm going there, but I'm also changing slightly because of that. I'm sort of saying, well, that's what it would have felt like to have been one of those people and how they felt. It's, you know, you could call it empathy, I guess. Um, maybe it's something else. I don't know. And, you know, sometimes I get a little, I get a little fancy and I call it time travel. But I think all art, all, all, all art does that. I think it's this, my snapshot theory of art is that that's what art is. A snapshot of something. And I think if you go on that journey and you travel and you encounter that, you gain understanding of, sort of, first of all, why these people did what they did, why it matters, what's the value of it. And also going forward, you can see, well, I like this aspect of it. I don't like so much this aspect of it. You put it all together and, you, you know, you, 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 I think you um, alter your consciousness as a, as a result. And I think that's very valuable. And, you know, because I do that, I practice that on a daily basis. I've been doing it since age of 12 and 13 when I learned basics of speed reading and all that, or at least the version of speed reading that I, that I was taught at that time. Um, I'm able to do this podcast. I'm able to talk to a guest and, and you have some familiarity. I mean, there's a lot of things I'm no expert on. I mean, there's so much like Warhol. My friend Jay Reed knows more about Warhol. He knows as much as Blake Gottnick, certainly more than me. And I'll talk to Jay Reed and he'll, you know, he really goes deep into it. I'm not as deep into it. I admire Warhol tremendously. I think he is underrated for this reason I said earlier, because there's a kind of, I think it's a kind of a snobbery about commercial culture, you know, and the fact that Warhol is dealing with commercial culture is, is a resistance to that, I think. Um, but you know, you can't be an expert on everything, but I know a little bit and I'm going to learn more and I, and, and, uh, you know, look, I mean, I had a friend of mine who was an abstract painter, really good painter in Boston. And he was a, he was a gay man and he, he, and he and I, we would have an art salon and we would have lunch and stuff and outdoors, especially in the summer. And he taught at, uh, where did he teach? One of the great art schools, not mass art, uh, and not RISD, Pratt maybe, I don't know. I don't remember. But I do remember he really disliked Warhol. And this is the first time I encountered the kind of the anti-Warhol, which is a thing, the anti-Warhol argument, which is typical, you know, sort of anti-commercial, anti-establishment, sellout, that's the word sellout. I mean, Warhol says I wanted to create a business art. Now, Warhol is quite explicit. I want to make a sort of a business genre of art. Now, someone like, his name was Michael, this painter, who took painting very seriously, was really, that was anathema to him. Like, you know, that's my muse that Warhol's destroying. You know? Now, I don't agree with Michael. I like Michael's painting. Um, but, you know, from my perspective on this show, Journey of the Sea, that's a question, all a question of styles and conflict. You know, that's Michael's style is not Warhol's style. The world needs both, I think. And it's a little half past noon. I think I've talked for too long. I feel maybe I could go on maybe more, but uh, I would like to uh, talk about some of the books in the future. I think I'd like to do a book lunch on um, Samantha Rose Hill's book on um, Hannah Arendt would be good. Uh, I like to do a couple of works of fiction. If anybody has any ideas, I mean, I'm certainly, um, if you say, you know, read this book and I think it's worth reading, I'll read it and we'll do, we'll do a, uh, an interactive or group discussion. But I, I do thank you for this first book lunch. Um, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going to have some of this candles, tomato soup. Barbara Loden. Um, Barbara Loden book 
Is it Sonata for, well, no, Sonata for Barbara Loden. I love that book. Its author's French. L Laurie, if you could contact her, we can contact her. I'd love to actually have her on our show. Um, you know. So yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. See, Barbara Loden is the same world as Warhol. It's the same sort of era. It's that same period. 60, Mid-60s, late 60s, early 70s. And yes. Um, well, that yeah, I want to do I want to do shows on what I would call personal or idiosyncratic biography, which that book is an example, and that's very different than this kind of biography. You need both, and um, I like to feature both on our show. So thank you. I hope you have a safe weekend, a good weekend, and and maybe maybe you can read a good book and. We could talk about it. Thank you.